Hi and welcome to Stella Flicks. This is a video about how to photograph what is known as flat copy and how to do it properly using copy lighting. So, what is flat copy? Well, no prizes for guessing, it's anything that's flat. So typically that would be something such as a book or a print, a painting or a drawing or perhaps an old photograph or an artwork or maybe a map. It could even be something as simple as the grain of a plank of wood. And the purpose of copying it may be to reproduce it or record or document it. Or perhaps to send it to be entered in a competition or for publishing, in which case it's sensible to submit the very best quality you can muster. For a lot of things, an ordinary scanner will make a perfectly good job of it. But of course it may be too big to go into the scanner, like the 12 metre long Persian carpet I once had to photograph for Sotheby's and that too needed to be really evenly illuminated so that it reproduced well in a high quality catalogue. So if your copy is too big the only thing you can do is to photograph it with a camera and using copy lighting. It's the old way but it still works. Of course your flat copy might be transparent it could be anything from a photographic transparency, or a negative, or a glass painting, or even a stained glass window. All of these need lighting from behind and there are ways of doing that properly too. But for this video I'm just concentrating on opaque reflective surfaces which need to be evenly lit from the front. So this is about how to provide that clean, even illumination for a flat surface. By the way, knowing how to achieve this is useful in other sorts of photography as well. For example, getting a nice evenly lit background behind a portrait is essentially just scaled up copy lighting, even if it's coloured. And copy lighting is frequently used for product photography, such as the front of a packet, or an overhead shot of a bowl of soup or a bowl of cornflakes. It all boils down to getting the light even and there is a right way and a wrong way to go about it. Of course for a lot of us just picking up a simple camera or your phone and going click will do. It's quite good enough for purpose. But if for some reason you can't do that or if you want to do it properly there is a way to do it properly and learning that is a useful skill. So what sort of special equipment do we need? Well, the good news is that you may not need any special kind of equipment at all other than the camera you already have and a reasonably good tripod or other sort of stand to put it on. With decent lighting you can even make a good job of copying with a phone. Maybe not this one. What you will need however is a matched pair of lights. These can be either continuous light or flash units. The ones you see here are flash units but it's not essential you can actually use a matching pair of angle poise lamps. As long as they throw bright, even and flicker free illumination they'll do the trick just fine. Something to bear in mind is to try and keep your setup away from any brightly coloured walls or drapes or furniture because the colour cast from that will affect your copy. If you want good quality a camera support of some kind is absolutely essential. Don't try and do this handheld, it doesn't work. This is a classic setup for photographing paintings, but for smaller things such as books or photographs it's actually very cumbersome and you might need to set up in a different way. Here a board has been set up at an angle to give the artwork something to sit on. But the classic problem with this setup is getting your camera square on to the surface. It's notoriously difficult. A better idea is to use a copy stand. You can buy these purpose made. This one is actually made from an old enlarger baseboard and column found cheaply on eBay. The advantage as you can see is that your camera will remain square to your baseboard while you adjust the height. The big red clamp is just to hold the strap up out of the way. It's better really to take the strap off. Whatever kind of camera support you're using, don't forget to use some kind of remote release and if you have a DSLR then don't forget to lock up the mirror. The sign of a good copy is the absence of any distortion, so it's very important to keep your camera back parallel to the plane of your copy. The grid pattern on a cutting mat can be very useful to help you square up your copy but the mats themselves can be quite flexible. 
If they are, just put a board underneath to straighten them up. It's also vital that your original is level. And that goes for your camera back too. This is a cumbersome way of doing it, but you might find it easier to buy a purpose-made spirit level which goes into the flash shoe of your camera. My favourite method is this. Just take a small mirror, place it against your lens and then drop it down vertically and put it onto the surface of your original. It needs to be fairly centralised on your original to make this work properly. You'll have to refocus too. You may have to adjust the angle of your camera and the position of your original a little to get this into the centre, but eventually you should see the reflection of your own lens. When it appears inside the centre mark of your viewfinder, the camera must be absolutely perpendicular to the surface. Just refocus and you're ready to go. Don't forget to take away the mirror first. Neat trick, isn't it? Try that out with some graph paper or a cutting mat to see if you got it right. If you have, the squares will look spot on. Some copies just don't want to lie flat. If you've got this trouble, weight the corners down or better still, the edges using a couple of steel rules. Make sure they point at the lights to avoid getting any shadow onto the surface. The object of the exercise is to get a flat, neatly framed and square on original that's been evenly illuminated, which sadly I haven't quite arranged for this one, you can see it's a bit darker on the left. The light needs some adjustment. Books are particularly tricky because they won't lie flat. They need a special technique. If you don't get them lying flat, you can get these kind of reflections happening on the curve of the page. The trick is to turn the book through 90 degrees so that the spine points at the lights. This rather ghastly looking gadget is something I made up out of two pieces of old scrap wood and a length of elastic. It's a book holder. Arranged like this, it will make taking photographs out of books much more straightforward. You may also need a clip on the leading edge to help pull the page down flat. Having said that, you'll probably find that it won't come completely flat, but it'll be a great improvement. Make sure you're using sufficient depth of field to cover any slight curvature which may happen. If you're photographing text, you'll find that a Kodak Grey card or similar will make life much more easy in terms of getting your exposure right. If you think about it, text is white and black, and if you just expose for a white page with some black text on it, you'll probably find that the results would be very underexposed. The grey card will prevent this. A bit more about that later on. Don't forget that books are subject to copyright, and if you photograph them, you may be infringing that. Lighting needs to be even, equal, and opposite. A good way of checking that out is to measure the distance of your lights. But don't trust to that alone. Even matched lights will have some irregularities and differences. A much more accurate way is to use your eye and check the shadows. They should be equal. You can see here that the shadow on the left hand side is lighter than the shadow on the right hand side, meaning that the light on the left hand side is too close. If it is, then it's going to have this kind of effect on one side of your image it will make it look brighter. To fix that, put a sheet of white paper down on your original and stand a felt tip pen or a board marker in the middle. Then adjust your lights until the two shadows look equal. If your two lights are identical, then they should end up evenly spaced. But if they're not, don't worry about it because the shadow trick is the proof. It's important to make sure that the top edges of your lights are no more than 45 degrees above the centre of your original, or even a little bit lower. Otherwise, you may find you're getting reflections from them. This appears to be a fairly good result. But if you look closely at the N on the San Remo, you'll notice that it's a bit lighter than the other characters. This is actually because the original is slightly glossy, and it's reflecting the light from the ceiling above. The only way past that is to either paint your ceiling black or, more practically, hang a dark sheet over the copy area. It's getting a bit serious now, isn't it? There's more to this copying business than meets the eye. For example, an oil painting or an acrylic painting may be heavily impastoed, which means it's kind of lumpy, really, and that will pick up light and reflections you don't want. You may also have an image under glass, which you either can't or don't want to dismantle. 
These both need photographing under cross-polarised light, which is another video altogether, kind of beyond the scope of this one. You might find no matter how hard you try, getting your lights even seems to be impossible. This is often due to hot spots being created by bright metal reflectors or just irregularities in your lamps. The only way to find out if they're doing this is to photograph them. If they are creating hot spots, you'll find that hanging some diffusing material in front of each head will help. Here's our old friend the Kodak Grey card once again. Pointing your camera at text will probably lead the light meter in your camera astray. Using the grey card will help it. Just lay one down flat on top of your original and take your reading from that. Don't forget to set your camera to the correct colour temperature for the lighting you're using, whether it's tungsten or flash. It's best to avoid fluorescent lighting of any kind because although it looks good to the eye, it doesn't come out well in photography. You'll have more control over colour balance if you shoot in RAW. Some kinds of post-production software, such as Adobe Lightroom, have a built-in colour checker tool. The grey card provides you with a neutral grey area to click on with this tool, and it will help you bring your colour temperature into pretty much the right ballpark. You might have to tweak it a bit, but it'll get you pretty close. An exposure meter is by no means essential, but if you do have one, and especially if it's a flash ambient kind, you'll find it's an excellent way of getting your exposure absolutely spot on for either sort of light. If it's this kind, it's important to put the dome down, because that way it will only see light from above in the same way that the copy does. If you use the dome up, you may collect light from elsewhere, and that can lead to inaccuracies. Apart from just exposure, the light meter can also help you check that you've got your lighting even from one corner to the other, from one side to the other. Things are looking pretty good here because the meter is giving the same f-stop in the center and right across to the edges. It's still a great idea to check those shadows. I said earlier on that you might not need any special equipment other than your ordinary camera to get close. But of course, if you want extreme detail, you might need a little help. Some camera lenses have a built-in and so-called macro facility. Strictly speaking, they're not real macro, but they certainly do get you in close. They're very versatile and very helpful, and very often ideal for copying. A slight drawback with these is that the macro facility is often only available at the wide end of the zoom range. This is likely to produce a degree of barrel distortion. Most zooms will give a better result at the longer end of their focal length range. Anything from 50mm upwards is good. Another good alternative for getting close is the Humble extension tube. These are usually sold in sets of three and can be used singly or stacked in pairs or even all three together. You'll probably find you only need to use the one. They just fit to the back of the lens which then attaches to your camera in the usual way. The ideal lens is, of course, a dedicated macro lens. You may find that the 100mm focal length depicted here is a little bit long for copying and a 50mm or 60mm might be easier to handle. At the other end of the price spectrum, the simple close-up lens or supplementary lens will provide very good close-up facility. The quality, of course, isn't going to match that of an expensive macro lens, but the price is very attractive. Again, you can stack these. You always put the weakest one on the front. Well, that's about as far as I want to take this video for flat copy. There are other kinds of flat copy too. If you're old enough to be a film photographer, the chances are you'll have some transparencies, slides hanging around, and you may even have film negatives. Essentially, they can be copied too. Obviously not using the same method as this. There are other methods and I can do another video about those if I get any requests. Okay, so that was lighting for flat copy. I hope you found it both useful and enjoyable. In any case, thanks for watching. See you next time. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye for now.